morning, all. The Senate Tax Committee will come to order. It's March 6th, uh, 2009. March 8th. No, I didn't change the date. She did not change the date. The first error of the day. It's the seventh. <laughs> we, will get, we will get better. Uh, so welcome. Uh, today we've got uh, four or five bills on the docket, uh, starting out with Senator Chamberlain on sports uh, wagering. And as we get into this, I just want to emphasize that uh, we want to focus on the tax issues today. If, uh, if you're for or against betting, that's best uh, talked about in the state government committee. This bill will get referred uh, with an amendment to the state government committee. So we'd prefer that you leave your discussions related to uh, the, uh, the, the whole idea of whether or not uh, gambling is proper or not to that committee. So. Today we focus on taxes on this bill, Senate File 1894, Senator Roger Chamberlain. Roger. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, thank you for that and for the clarification. And what we have in front of us is Senate File 1894. This is sports betting. I wanted to just give a paragraph or two of just background of why this is here. And then I'll get into the Senator Chamberlain, we do have a quorum oh, and uh, you do have an amendment. We could do that now. I should have uh, remembered that. I do have an amendment, an author's amendment. I believe it's A5. Okay, we have the A5 amendment before us. Uh, uh, any questions on amendment? Uh, Senator Chamberlain, would you like to explain any of it? Uh, uh, an author's amendment, we understand. There were some procedural things, removing sections and clarifying some language along the way to get it uh, tidied up okay. the way we needed it to move uh, Questions on the A5 amendment? Sensing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay, and the A5 amendment is on the bill. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So back in 1992, uh, the U.S. Congress passed a law, PASPA, the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act. That act effectively outlawed or made illegal sports betting. Obviously, a couple states were already doing it, so they were grandfathered in, most notably uh, Nevada. Now, as time has gone on, uh, some years later, a couple years ago, New Jersey filed a lawsuit, Governor Christie, to um, uh, overturn that and get, get rid of it. The uh, technical reasons that it was uh, challenged. Well, last May, May of 18, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, uh, threw out PASBA, thereby essentially authorizing states and making it legal to uh, uh, allowing, make, allowing states to make it legal to bet on sports. It's still up to the states as to whether or not they're going to legalize that, but essentially it took down the federal barrier to states legalizing sports betting. So the second piece of this is we will, there are many parts to the sports betting uh, pr uh, proposal, but as you had mentioned, we're going to stick to the tax piece, but just a paragraph or so, a few words on the general idea here, <coughs> excuse me, one is that this, this is a business, it's a profession, it's entertainment. Uh, people have opinions just like they have opinions about, they have opinions on sports just as they have opinions on uh, investing in stock markets or what, uh, what they're going to have for dinner or um, whether they're going to eat Twinkies or Ho-Hos. So what I, I see this as a... Um, uh, people having opinions and investing in those opinions in the sporting industry, professional and um, the collegiate area. People do make a living off of this. Uh, if you listen to some sports, uh, sports radio and content from Las Vegas, people do make a very good living off of this. And they also have a lot of fun. We all know people that have been out to Vegas or other places in the state uh, uh, wagering on sports, wagering their favorite teams, and uh, we're just trying to create a legal structure around that to make it, to regulate it, legalize it, regulate it, make it safe and accessible to uh, people so they can invest in their opinions and have some fun. Uh, just as a, a side note, we, you know, there's a lot of estimates of how much uh, betting would go on. Nevada, for example, has a total wagering on a yearly basis, about $5 billion. It goes up each year. We would estimate, this isn't hard, but you could easily estimate Minnesota being around the 2 to $3 billion mark. I don't have the market study for that, 
But if you think about various uh, the variables, that could be the case. So now we get to the point of, of taxation. So the, what you have, the Article 2, page 9, as I believe is where it starts. So the taxation of this, there's a couple components to it. First is we have the state revenue tax. Uh, the state will levy a tax on the net gaming revenue. It goes by different names. The handle, gaming revenue, and I believe our uh, it's defined here as net revenue. Net revenue is defined as uh, gro the uh, gross, all the, all the wagers, less the prizes paid out. So you get a... If you were to get $1,000 in total bets on, um, you know, whether it's going to snow tomorrow and, and then um, people win or lose, you pay out you know, $500, then what you have left is the handle, the net, 500 bucks, And that's where the tax would be levied in this uh, proposal. The tax we're talking about is 6.75% on that net, that gaming revenue. That is the same amount that, uh, that's the same level that Nevada levies in the same spot. Our simple assumption is that Nevada has been doing this for decades. We traveled out there to Nevada, talked to a lot of people, and everybody seems to be fairly comfortable with the way they're running the operations. And it's affordable for the bookmakers, the pools, as well as for the uh, people who make the wagers. If we set the tax on the gross on the handle it causes more distortion just from a theoretical uh, 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 point you create more distortion if you talk to some people if you tax the sale the bet the wager maybe they'll just stay in the in the illegal market and continue to transact business there so again the first part is the state tax 6.75 on the net or the gaming revenue net gaming revenue and that is in lieu of uh, state income tax, franchise taxes, sales taxes, or charitable gaming taxes. So no other tax, just that net that tax on net gaming revenue. So with that, the next uh, series of um, next sections you see, and if you have questions, you can also ask uh, uh, Council Ms. Pollack. But essentially, because we're not taxing the income and the, the gains and losses of the uh, sports betting operation, <coughs> we have to add back losses and subtract gains from the federal tax return, uh, both at the corporate side and the individual side. Then you get to, that way you're not taxing all the revenue again. You get back to where we were going to be taxing it. Um, uh, next, the collection and disposition. Uh, so the money is collected, goes to the general fund of that money. Uh, point half, uh, half a percent will be taken and put into uh, to the, was it, the Department of Health. And that will help uh, uh, for uh, compulsive gambling treatment. That's a similar treatment we, uh, the similar, similarly, we treat the other gambling revenue the same way in the state. So this is being treated the same way as well. Point half a percent and we'll go to treat gambling, uh, compulsive gambling. Um, I already talked about the definition of what we're taxing, uh, be gross, uh, gross wagers, less prizes paid out, gives you the net gaming revenue, and that's where the 6.75% would be levied. Uh, we also require reporting, monthly reporting from the sports pools and the books. This is done in uh, Nevada as well and probably other states. This is common sense. Uh, we'll track it monthly, see how they're going, collect the revenue, track it, and see the progress. Um, lastly, that's, that's it, I think, for the tax side. Uh, last, I guess one last thing I would say is the federal government does levy a tax on this. It's uh, half a percent, I believe. Council can correct me on that if I'm wrong, but I believe, believe it was a half a percent on the gross gaming revenue itself. So that's that's the tax part. That's a brief overview and why I'm doing it, why we're here, why we're here, why we're doing this, and the tax portion of the bill. Ms. Pollack, uh, I would ask, did I miss anything on the tax piece? I probably did. Ms. Pollack? 
M Mr. Chair, no, but Mr. Wilms, I think, has uh, some information on the federal uh, application of Okay, thank tax. you, Ms. Paul. Well. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, the uh, federal hand, uh, tax is on the handle, and it's a quarter of a percent. Okay. Thank you. So with that, um, Mr. Chair and members, I'm done with my testimony, and I don't know, I don't have any testifiers lined up for this tax piece of it. So whatever you prefer. Uh, members, any questions of Senator Chamberlain at this point? If not, we'll go on to the testifiers. Senator Dietzik. Um, thank you, <coughs> Chair Sanjum. Um, so Chair Chamberlain, we briefly talked before, um, and I do appreciate the discussion. I know this is happening um, here already illegally, and I know other states are looking at it, so I'm not sure where I stand on this yet, but I do appreciate the discussion. Um, have you had conversations, and this bill doesn't really address it, and it might be in future committees, but just what are the impacts, and I'll, and I'll phrase it since we're in the tax committee, what are the tax implications of this, um, and have you looked at on the charities, on the lottery? I mean, we get um, money from LCCMR, gets money from the lottery, so how, are, how is this all going to um, interact? Chamberlain? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Dedzik, yes. Uh, we, I've talked to Mr. Barrett, and I apologize. I forget the name of the uh, gentleman who runs the lottery, uh, the lot oversees the lottery, state lottery. We've talked to them, and we've had uh, conversations with some of the charitable gaming operators as well. Uh, we are aware of this, and they would have a concern. We have thought about backup plans in case something happens. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I believe there might be some movement in those in those uh, dollars. Someone may decide to place a wager instead of doing a uh, lottery or a charitable gaming. I, I'd say a couple of things now. I haven't seen any specific, I had asked some other experts uh, across the nation on, if they had any information or data on, on this, and they really haven't got any about the substitution or opportunity cost. Uh, so I, I have asked, uh, have spoke with people in the state, asked nationally. Third piece I'd say is, I would estimate the impact wouldn't be too high because the way the bill is written, it will be at either tribal casinos or the two racetracks. And um, if you're in the mood for charitable gaming in your community, you're not gonna have a kiosk. We prohibit kiosks in this bill. <clears throat> you're not gonna have a kiosk in your local pub or in the local uh, quick trip or SA. So I think the impact on the lotteries or charitable gaming uh, would be mitigated because of that. And finally, part of this whole process, although not exclusively part of this process, is that charitable gaming needs some review and reform, and we have been talking about that with others this session. And we heard some bills earlier. The impetus for that was not necessarily this bill, but uh, coincidentally, as they come along, that reform will help strengthen and uh, bolster the local charitable gaming operations. They'll keep more money in the communities as we heard earlier uh, a couple few weeks ago. So for those reasons, we don't have the data. We, uh, there's not really any available. Uh, I think the impact will be mitigated because of the locations and where the licensees will be and uh, some of the reforms we'll have. And there was one other idea that the lottery had about perhaps doing the parlays through the state lottery. Delaware does that. I don't know if that's the best option. I only heard about it a couple of weeks ago. It might be something, but um, as we haven't explored that. Senator Dietzik, any follow-ups? Okay. <clears throat> Senator Anderson. Hey, Mr. Chair, Senator Chamberlain, uh, obviously this has a lot changed in the last year, but uh, you started to touch on it maybe from a tax perspective. What do you think uh, people are doing in other states on this? From what a you, tax What have you learned? Yeah. From a tax perspective? Well, the taxes are... Um, all over the board, most states are doing, I had a chart, I don't remember all of them, there's about eight states active now. Uh, they have different rates. The highest is Pennsylvania, right around 36%, which everybody says is ridiculous. Nobody's gonna, <laughs> nobody's gonna open a book or place a wager when you got that kind of impact, and they're, and they're right next door to New Jersey. 
Um, but uh, the rates go from, from about 675, some states have, I think, 10%. They have different brackets. They'll tax it at different positions, different spots, and different amounts. So it's it's there's no one uh, best answer for this for the states. They all many states think it's uh, a money maker for them, and it might be. But I I think is when I was working with Representative Garofalo and others here, thought was that Nevada has been working at 6.75. We're not in this to to raise a whole lot of revenue. We want people to take part in a, in a business, a profession, and have some fun while they're doing it. So our goal was not to raise a lot of revenue. But I think the low is about 6% or something in tax, all the way up to 36% for for uh, Pennsylvania. Mr. Okay. Anyone else? Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, uh, currently sports betting is illegal in the state of Minnesota. Uh, but we know it's happening, and uh, there are offshore accounts and uh, mobile apps that people can use. Do you have any idea, uh, is there, or is there any way to measure how much sports betting is going on in the state of Minnesota illegally right now? Senator Chamberlain? The, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Miller. There's no specific estimate for Minnesota, but some of the estimates and the studies we have that have been conducted and in, in testimony during the, the Supreme Court case, the numbers ranged nationally anywhere from $150 billion to f over $400 billion in illegal sports wagering. I think the consensus is probably near $150 billion to $200 billion of the illegal sports wagering. In Minnesota, uh, it, you know, I was speaking with someone earlier. I don't have a hard, fast market uh, number on this. I'd have to do some more digging. I was told that in Minnesota you could expect maybe two to three billion dollars in uh, when we get to legal wagering in, in legal wagering in the state of Minnesota. I, I don't think that's too far off the mark. If you think about Nevada being about five billion and growing, we have surrounding states. If they don't legalize it, we'll have some of that. Plus, you expand the market to make it safer, more accessible. I think it's reasonable to believe that in Minnesota you could get to about you know two to three billion dollars of of legal wagering eventually in the state of Minnesota. And just to put a fine, uh, to sum up, Senator Miller, nothing specific in Minnesota, national number around $150 billion, $200 billion of illegal sports wagering currently, and I would guess Minnesota could be easily around 2 to $3 billion for the reasons stated. Mr. Chamberlain, I have one. Uh, for the those host locations that uh, would uh, would be doing this, uh, and you have, may have may have mentioned this. What would be their what would be their cut, if you will? What would be their profit? Is that based on a percentage? Well, the of course, if it's if it's the tribal if the tribes take part, and I hope they do. Uh, I see this. Many people see this as a uh, an accessory to the business, a business enhancement, and uh, something to enhance the business. If it's on the tribe, if it's with the tribes, if they choose to do this, they'd have to enter into a compact with the state. Uh, they request that, and then the compact is negotiated. And as you know, and many of you know, I wasn't around for the original one, but that compact, the bill requests a new compact, not a, not opening the old one. So a new compact, they could negotiate a lot of things. Uh, by federal law, the, as uh, Council James, who's helped me on this quite a bit, federal law, you're not technically supposed to take the money that way, but most states have revenue sharing agreements. Even Minnesota has some level of revenue sharing to an extent with the tribes, um, although uh, uh, some people like it, some people don't. But it would have to be a new compact, and the, any revenue sharing would be negotiated with the tribes in the revenue compact. Senator Chamber, just to follow up, that revenue sharing, would it come out of the 6.75%? Uh, presumably, yes, or any other fees they would suggest to put in there, but I would assume yes. Now, to that, to that end, the two racetracks, as you know, are on here, Canterbury and Running Aces would be included in this, and if they chose to do this, they are not subject, of course, to the compact, so it would just be a regular tax on them. Anyone else around the table? 
Okay. I'm sorry, Senator Franson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Chamberlain. Just to clarify on, on this line of, of, of questions, um, basically the fundamental idea is that right now tribes are sovereign nations, so they can't be asked or requested to share revenue with the state. So the right. only way that they could do it is if indeed they're open to share that revenue of 6.75. Um, so my two questions um, are, that would be just a sales tax, right? And why did you um, go the route of um, exempting both income and corporate franchise taxes, unless I misread this? Um, why um, going that route? Yeah, Chamber? Mr. Chair, Senator France, it can be a little confusing. I had to look at it a couple times and consult uh, the smart people, the staff. But because we are levying just one tax, on um, that gaming revenue, that is in lieu of any other taxes, anything that we have in the state. And because the federal, uh, they would complete their federal, two pieces, they complete their federal return, and that federal return may or may not tax these revenues, They're, and they'd have gains and or losses. So to mitigate that effect, when you come back to do the state return, we have to add back add back the losses and subtract the gains to nullify the effect of any federal tax on that income because we just had the one that we're levying. So we had to get zero that out. The second part of it is, and I just forgot what the second part of that was, uh, but it'll come back to me, Senator Franson, but that's why we, that's why that's there. Franson, follow up. Okay. okay uh, let's move on then to our, uh, some testifiers that we have on our, on our list. Uh, John McCarthy uh, of the Minnesota Indian Gaming Association. Uh, Mr. McCarthy, would you come forward? Are you here? There he is. And uh, why don't we bring to the table also uh, Jake uh, Grassel, uh, Citizens Against uh, Gambling Expansion. Mr. McCarthy, when you're ready. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome to the committee. I'm John McCarthy, Executive Director of the Minnesota Indian Gaming Association. Uh, our association includes all 11 tribal rec tribally recognized uh, tribes in the state of Minnesota. MIGA's mission is to protect Indian gaming, which is the only su successful economic development tool tribes have ever had. Minnesota tribes have invested uh, major resources in bricks and mortar casinos and facilities, ancillary facilities. There are economic uh, lifeblood and uh, for all practical purpose, this revenue is the tax for the tribes, which uh, in turn allows them to uh, pay for human services, schools, clinics, housing, nutrition programs, wastewater treatment facilities, law enforcement and emergency services, and other essential community needs. These revenues enable tribal governments to meet their responsibility to their people. As most of you know, the positive impacts of tribal gaming extend beyond our reservation boundaries. Tribal casinos are actually our ancillary facilities account for nearly 20,000 jobs in Minnesota, over 500 million in wages and benefits to our employees, and nearly 500 million in goods and services purchased from other Minnesota businesses and vendors. Because these operations are essential to the ability of tribal governments to meet the needs of their people, similar to state taxes, MIGA has had long-standing positions opposing the expansion of gambling off reservations and uh, gambling in Minnesota. The position was originally adopted in 1994 and remains today. While we appreciate the goodwill behind the provisions that would allow tribes to offer sports bettings betting, we nevertheless have some serious concerns. First, the bill's authorization of gaming online and to mobile devices is deeply concerning to the tribes. It would create the largest expansion of gambling in Minnesota in more than a quarter century, and therefore MIGA must respectfully oppose SF-1894. The, exist of, of, the existence of mobile online sports betting leads almost inevitably to the legalization of further internet gambling, which represents an even more significant threat to all types of bricks and mortar facilities that currently offer gambling. 
tribal casinos, racetracks, lottery outlets, and bars with char charitable gambling. Um, there is another issue that I have not heard discussed, and, uh, and I believe it, it, it's a very uh, significant issue, and that is the, the, uh, the, comp the, uh, the, uh, the bill's uh, uh, mention of taxes for tribes. Uh, that is not uh, something that is authorized by the federal government. So, uh, as was mentioned, uh, some states have negotiated uh, with tribes, but, it, but according to federal law, it has to be something purchased of value, uh, not a tax. Well, uh, Connecticut, for example, uh, they had exclusivity, and the state of Connecticut still do, and that was how they negotiated their agreement. Uh, so, I mean, it, it can be done, and it appears to be taxes, but uh, they're very strict. The National Indian Gaming Commission would have to approve any agreements, and uh, uh, so it's gonna be more complex to figure out how that would all fit together. Uh, sports betting is a complicated issue with much more that remains unknown. A few states rushed into legalizing sports gambling last year in a variety of forms, and others are considering it now, however, Questions on tax rates and gray market conversions, proper regulations, and a recent reinterpretation of the Federal Wire Act by the US DOJ all persist. Because of these complexities, two months ago, uh, MIGA's chairman, uh, Chairman Vig, wrote a letter to the Governor Walls and legislative leaders urging a, a go slow, measured policy making approach on sports betting. We also encourage the legislature to take the time to examine how legal sports betting is performing in other states and learn from their experiences, good and bad. Before risking damage to the Minnesota's existing legal gambling industry and the benefits it produces for the people and communities of our state. On behalf of the 11 tribes of Minnesota, we thank you for the opportunity to come in and voice our opinion. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Any questions for Mr. McCarthy? Uh, Mr. McCarthy, I have one just to clarify. Uh, so you're suggesting, or stating at least, that the, uh, the application of, uh, of a 6.75% tax on sports wagering at a, at a tribal casino would, would uh, I, I, think, I think you said, violate federal law. Is that, is that correct? Oh. Uh, As you see it at least? It, it, it currently would have to be under different circumstances than it would for, say, a racetrack because of the fact that the federal government um, can, does not allow state governments or anyone to tax tribal gaming. Uh, and, and it starts from, from the fact that, that the federal law, uh, uh, Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, uh, passed in 1989, uh, clearly says that the benefit uh, financial of, or otherwise from tribal gaming has to be with the tribe and only the tribe. And so, uh, like I said, there's been, there's been ways to work around that. Now, people say, well, the tribes already pay taxes. Well, it's not really, they don't, don't really pay taxes. For example, um, fire services, law enforcement services, water and sewer, different things like that. Uh, they, they buy those services from the local communities. They're not paying them taxes. They're paying them for a service, which meets the qualification because there's something uh, being, being purchased. Uh, also, uh, the tribes do a, a annual payment to the state of Minnesota uh, to the uh, Department of Public Safety uh, for uh, enforcement and monitoring. So it, it's a complex issue, but uh, I, what I'm saying is, is that it can't be treated like everything else because there's there's barriers to doing it, and uh, you know, uh, is, is, are, does the state or someone else are they interested in negotiating that kind of an arrangement where the tribes wouldn't pay the tax, but they would they put something else together, and uh, and otherwise it, it's going to run into uh, legal problems. 
Well, thank you very much. It probably has to be worked out in the compact. Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. McCarthy or, or Senator uh, uh, Chamberlain, I, I thought in the testimony what I heard was this wasn't really a tax. It was a revenue sharing agreement that would be negotiated through a new compact. Wouldn't that then allow for what Senator Chamberlain has proposed, Mr. McCarthy? McCarthy? Well, I, I, mean, I think we'd have to have a lot more detail, but uh, revenue sharing technically is, is a, a payment to the state uh, of, of gaming revenue. Uh, and you can call it revenue sharing, and sometimes they've done it, but they've gotten something for it. It isn't just, okay, you're, you're in the business of sports betting, here's the tax, so we're gonna send you a tax bill. Um, revenue sharing is we'll provide X and you pay X, then it isn't a tax. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, but I guess what I'm, my question is, when you go through the compact, it really, what it does is it's not a, let's say, let's say if you take uh, Canterbury, for example, as Senator Chamberlain said, they, they pay a 6.75% tax and there's no negotiation, there's no uh, consideration. Um, there's something in the compact where you're getting the right to uh, offer the service through the, the through the Gambling Commission, and yet, and then th there's a, a, a support for that, right? We've got to pay for that, gam we've got to pay for that oversight. Uh, isn't that part of the compact? Mr. McCarthy and uh, Senator Chamberlain wants to chime in too at some point. So go ahead, Mr. McCarthy. Well, uh, it, um, it's really uh, not in the compact specifically to, to uh, authorize revenue sharing if uh, and, and at least our compacts in Minnesota uh, and my understanding is, is that if it's in a compact where it is a tax uh, then the compact won't be approved by the National Indian Gaming Commission which you know that goes back to the drawing board uh, but I don't believe there, there's any, any uh, mandate in the compact that the tribes pay for even the oversight or the, the uh, uh, regulation. That was an agreement that was struck between the two. And the tribes just said, hey, you know, we understand that you're gonna be out there with your employees and you're gonna be monitoring this. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're willing to uh, help pay for some of that. And that's kind of exactly how that went. There was no mandate and, uh, and I believe that uh, the state said, you know, well, we gotta consider this. And the tribe said, well, yeah, we'll consider it. And that's what they came up with. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Senator Pratt. I, you know, again, two things. One is the tax is in there because obviously we've included race, two racetracks in here, so we had to have something there. Uh, there's no other, uh, there's no other article or section right now to address what Mr. McCarthy is talking about because we haven't had those negotiations and those conversations. Um, but quite often, as he has also mentioned and you alluded to, shared regulatory burdens, and that's where some revenue sharing would, would come into play. So it would be a new compact, those revenue sharing and uh, responsibility sharing things would be negotiated through the compact. But uh, I don't necessarily disagree with what Mr. McCarthy is saying on the tax on the tribes, but it's there because we have two racetracks that are in the, in the mix right now. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, then moving on to Senator, uh, pardon me, <laughs> Mr. Grassel. And thank you, Mr. McCarthy, very much for your testimony. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Grassel? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Jake Grassel and I represent Citizens Against Gambling Expansion. Our, organi our organization represents uh, thousands of Minnesotans who come from all walks of life, liberal, conservative, uh, different faiths, religious backgrounds. Um, they all come together for a common belief that they believe there's already too much gambling uh, in the state of Minnesota. And so therefore I come before you today to encourage you uh, to say no to sports gambling um, expansion in Minnesota. While the arguments of legalizing sports gambling uh, may seem meritorious at first blush, that is, uh, bringing a, a, an unregulated market of illegal gambling um, out of the shadows, 
upon further reflection and consideration, uh, the costs are too high and the benefits are too little. Uh, aside from any of the policy reasons, I'll keep this financial, the policy reasons of uh, expanding gambling, encouraging our, citizens, our citizenry to uh, gamble rather than invest or save, um, that should call for a no vote on the bill. Um, but as for the policy projections, the Department of Revenue's projection estimates that this sports gambling bill will bring in a $1.30 uh, per capita or roughly $7.25 million per year to the state. This is far too little income, uh, and it needs to be weighed uh, against the, the potential uh, extreme cost. The estimated annual cost of a pathological gambler to the state is $1,200, and a problem gambler is $715, which based upon our demographics in Minnesota results in approximately $197 million in annual costs to the state of Minnesota. This is due to the crime, business, and employment costs, bankruptcy, illness, social, service, social services costs, family costs, and other abuse costs such as theft, um, among others. These hard costs are amplified uh, by the ancillary and social costs to our state, such as that 20 to 30% of pathological gamblers have declared bankruptcy with an average cost of $39,000 per bankruptcy to creditors. 90% of pathological gamblers gamble away their paychecks or their family savings, and over 30% reported gambling debts of $75,000 to $150,000, including money borrowed from family members. What's important about this is this is money that is going into gambling rather than money that can be spent, uh, that's being spent down at your local service station um, or in other areas that provide uh, tax to the state from profit generation and from profit generating enterprises. While these, while these economic impacts are measurable, the societal impacts of the bill are immeasurable but severe. The striking divorce rate and costs associated with it, the increased likelihood of violence against a spouse me, or child. Mr. Castle, could you kind, yeah. of, kind of focus on the taxes I, I, part as I, much I'm as I'm getting can. to the, yeah, I'm, so th what, what's important about that is the costs um, of problem gambling to the state uh, are amplified by the propensity uh, to where they are able to gamble. So with this bill, we're seeing a large expansion into uh, what's going to undoubtedly occur uh, into a mobile or online plat platform, which will create more pathological or problem gamblers, uh, which ultimately uh, will bear a huge cost onto the state. So with the costs associated with this expansion of government, uh, expansion of government in this bill, the amount realized will be extremely minor, if anything, once the costs associated with problem gambling are realized due to its effects. Finally, the, the argument that this will bring illegal gambling out of the shadows and thus uh, create a large tax revenue windfall um, has not bared out in other states and studies show uh, that this will not bear out as, uh, and potentially have the opposite effect as, as sports gambling uh, becomes essentially okay, uh, the tax avoidance of going on and still using uh, black market operators uh, will remain and likely increase. Uh, so in conclusion, um, at first blush, this seems to be a money-making venture and good policy for the citizens of our state. But upon further re reflection, it turns out uh, that often policies that are worth exploring uh, should be shelved as a bad deal. Uh, we see this bill as a bad deal financially for the state of Minnesota and its citizens, and we encourage you uh, to vote no. Thank you very much. Uh, questions of Mr. Grassel? Mr. Wilms. Mr. Wilms. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, I uh, just wanted to make a clarifying comment about uh, the testimony. The revenue estimate that the Department of Revenue produced uh, came back as unknown. So um, there's no, uh, you know, official estimate on what this would raise in terms of revenue. The last bullet point of the revenue estimate indicates that of, of three states that have recently uh, legalized sports wagering um, on a per capita basis, that would suggest that it could be seven million for the state. But um, all these states have legalized gaming, sports wagering for less than a year. So the data is still in the infancy, um, and the regulatory and tax rates could be different. So um, just want to throw a lot of caution on, on the revenue estimate and what we think it could raise. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilms. 
Senator Chamberlain, do you want to comment to any of the testimony? Uh, just a quick, quick thing. Yeah, I, I appreciate Mr. Grassl's comments and thoughts. Uh, we, I, to Mr. Wilms point, never thought this was going to be a big money maker for the state. Uh, it's, it's got other, other reasons for doing it, but not to, uh, not thinking we're going to solve a budget crisis with uh, sports betting. So thank you. What else? Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Grassl. And we move on now to uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Chris Sink, Chris Sink, uh, Joint Religious uh, Legislative Council. And please, uh, again, to the extent you can, try to focus on the taxes. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Ann Krisnick. I'm the executive director of the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition, which is made up of the Minnesota Council of Churches, the Minnesota Catholic Conference, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and the Dakotas, and the Islamic, Islamic Center of Minnesota. Um, at the request of the chair, I'm going to limit my comments to fiscal concerns about the bill. We would absolutely agree with the fiscal analysis prepared by the Department of Revenue, which says the impact of this bill is unknown. It's unknown not only in terms of revenue, but it's really unknown in terms of the ultimate cost that this creates to the state. Our faith traditions have serious concerns about the social costs, but they come with very, very clear financial costs as well. Unemployment compensation, uh, safety net programs, other social services, criminal prosecution and investigative costs, and a number of other issues. In 2008, the United States International Gambling Report did a series, a collection of academic and government reports, which analyzed national statistics for the government costs of $3 in social welfare spending for each dollar that gambling generated. Both Australia and Spain have legalized electronic online betting. A 2017 report in the state of Victoria in Australia determined that the cost of online betting to the state for 2014-15 totaled $7 billion. That included $2.2 billion resulting from loss uh, from family and relationship problems and $1.3 billion due to financial losses from excessive spending or bankruptcy. Two years after online gambling became lawful in Spain, a study found a significant increase in the number of young people who became pathological gamblers. And it specifically noted that online gambling is more addictive than other types of game because of its immediate accessibility and ease of betting. The research on gambling is incredibly troubling. We have a number of problem gamblers already in the state. We have serious concerns about making that more available. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and we urge you to vote now. Questions of Ms. Grissing? Since they none, uh, Senator Chamberlain, any concluding comments? Yeah, just on one quick bill? one here, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, maybe people consider mobile betting phones with online. Uh, perhaps that's what they consider online too, but my, my mind for online is, you know, going to the computer and, doing it that way in the traditional ways. But that's how I think of it. I, our piece does not allow the computer, online computer, just mobile betting. But maybe people think they're one and the same. So as far as closing comments, I appreciate the discussion and the focus on taxes. Again, a complicated issue, big issue, uh, a lot of hurdles. But uh, again, I this is... Me, uh, Vinny Mahulio out of Vegas, he, like I said, he looks at this as uh, opinions. People have opinions, and they want to invest in those opinions. It's a, prof it's a business, a profession, it's entertainment, like anything else we do. There are, and anything else we do, there are challenges and problems, uh, no matter what it is. Uh, we can eat too much Twinkies and, and things like that, and we understand that that's not to downplay the challenge of of gambling and the problems it can cause. It can cause problems, uh, but we have a system to deal with it and a uh, process to, to deal with it as well. And it, it's happening now. So uh, I don't think this will ex necessarily make it worse for anybody, but um, uh, we do recognize that. So profession, business, entertainment, and as far as the tax goes, uh, I think there's no real challenges or question with that. The uh, 
the uh, tribal casinos will have an issue with it, but that can be worked out as well. Uh, we have plenty of time to work on this. It's not effective until, would not be effective until September 2020, so a lot of time out there. So members, I thank you very much, and I thank the co-authors, last but not least, Senator Senjum, Senator Miller, Senator Bingham, and Senator Housley all of support of this bill. So thank you all very much. With that, um, on to State Gov we go. Thank you. Okay, so the motion then is uh, that uh, Senate File 1894, uh, as amended, be uh, referred to the State Government Committee. I'm sorry, Senator. Um, Mr. Chair, if I can make a, sure. just a few remarks as well, and, and I would like to ask for a roll call as well. Um, I like to have the, the conversation initially, uh, so I appreciate uh, Senator Chamberlain bringing this up because I've had constituents who are questioning whether Minnesota is going to go that route. My biggest concern right now um, and its initial conversation is the cost, um, not just to the state of Minnesota, by the unintended consequences maybe that we can't foresee for the same uh, reason, we don't have a fiscal note and have a, a real grasp of what this looks like in terms of cost and implementation and externalities to social services. Um, my biggest concern, too, is, is having um, the representative from the R11 nations that are that have presence in our state not supporting it at this point. So there's some work to be done there. Um, I also believe that... Um, you know, prohibition is not always the answer, and we do have a, a, a problem with the black market here, if you will. But to liberally open the floodgates for um, online or on your phone gambling um, right now, um, I, there's just too much to question. Um, that, and I don't believe the bill go, does go far enough to restrict or minimize those negative externalities. Um, so I believe there's there's room for this conversation, and I'm sure it's going to continue on the next um, next committee. But at this point, I will not be supporting the, the bill. Thank you. Okay, uh, roll call has been asked for. Uh, once again, the motion is to uh, the Senate file 1894 be recommended to pass and referred to the State Government Committee. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Chamberlain? Yes. Senjum? Yes. Rest? Pratt? Yes. Miller? Yes. Howe? Franzen? Dietzik? Bach, Anderson P. Yes. Bach, absent. Rest, absent. Dietzik. Dietzik. Yes. Sorry, I thought you said yes. How? How? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, with a uh, with a count of uh, of five yeses, two noes, uh, and one pass, and two absences, uh, the bill is. Uh, Approved and uh, we'll move forth then to state government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chamberlain. And, uh, and we move on. So, is the, is, the, is the press going to stay for captive insurance? We're going to have a good discussion <laughs> about captive insurance policy. <laughs> Moving on to Senate File 1502, uh, dealing with captive insurance. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, uh, when you're ready. Excuse All right. me. <laughs> Come on, it's good. It's good stuff. <laughs> She's begging people to stay. Don't go. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Okay. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Chair. Okay, back to order. Uh, Senator Chamberlain. Okay. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate File 1502. 1502 is a captive insurance policy bill. We had it last year in the in the OM bill. Uh, essentially, what it is, is, some of you may be familiar with captive insurance companies. They are part of usually part of a larger unitary group, and they help self-insure that group. 
uh, and those are well and good in and of themselves, but insurance companies don't pay a corporate franchise tax, they pay uh, premium taxes. Uh, so most companies operate uh, very well and do good at what they are doing, but right now in statute there's some some uh, some ambiguity as to what qualifies as a, a uh, good captive insurance company and a bad one. Uh, bad captive insurance companies are where uh, the company that it's, the unitary group will take some of the money and, sh and shove it over to the captive insurance group trying to, to hide uh, income or to get a lower tax rate. So that's what we're trying to stop. We're trying to clarify in statute what a uh, bad captive insurance company is and what a good one is, thereby uh, helping out and preventing perhaps some abuse and uh, saving the department some time in uh, investigating and looking into these matters. So in a nutshell, it's just clarifying the definition to protect the good ones and look out for the bad ones and save the department some time. And I'll let uh, Ms. Rowan fill in the gaps. Anything I missed? Ms. Rowan, welcome to the committee. State your name and uh, proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Robin Rowan. I am the executive director of the Minnesota Insurance and Financial Services Council, or MIFSI. We were laughing before because it's really nothing like a good insurance tax bill to completely clear a room. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with them, captive insurance companies are companies that are wholly owned and controlled by their insureds. And as Senator Chamberlain <coughs> mentioned, they are legitimate tools for larger companies to manage risk. However, captives have also been used to inappropriately exclude income from the franchise tax. So in the 2017 session, of the Department of Revenue added language to the tax bill to create a path for um, what I call naughty captives to pay the franchise tax. Um, however, that language didn't do a good enough job of distinguishing between commercial insurers and captives and then legitimate captives and naughty captives. So we spent a good portion of last year working with the Department of Revenue on agreed to language. And this is the language, the same language that we agreed to last year. And as Senator Chamberlain said, the language that was in um, all of the omnibus tax bills that went through last year and met a sad fate. Um, the, the, there's a two-part test. The first test in the bill distinguishes between commercial insurers like Ameriprise or New York Life and a captive insurer. Um, and the way it does that is to say that captives, uh, if you're going to be considered a captive, you either have to be licensed as a captive, which some states do, Minnesota doesn't, um, or 80% 80 80 of the premiums have to be from entities that are part of the unit unitary group. So in other words, the primary function of the entity is to insure other members of the unitary group. And then once a captive has been identified um, as a captive, the second part of the test distinguishes between naughty captives and nice captives. And it does this by determining whether it's functioning as an insurance entity. So it looks at what percentage of the um, captive's income are indeed insurance premiums and whether it's paying sufficient tax as a captive insurance company to be considered an insurance company. Uh, the rest of the bill deletes the language from 17 that um, we felt was too broad and wasn't clear enough. Um, so that's the compromise <coughs> language. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rowan. Any questions for the witness or Senator Chamberlain on this bill? Sensing none, I think, uh, I think you got it. <laughs> 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 All right. So Senate file 50 and 02 is recommended, uh, pardon me, laid over for possible inclusion uh, in the Senate uh, tax bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All in favor, say aye. Thank you. aye. Okay, right. going on 1537, Senator Chamberlain. Yes. Private Mr. letter ruling. Mr. Chair, 1537, private letter rulings. This also was in a has been discussed for a few years, even before I got here. Uh, but the department, the department doesn't like this one so much as the other one. But essentially what we, and it was in a bill last year. Essentially what we're doing is trying to create some, it's about customer service, creating some clarity and consistency for taxpayers in Minnesota. Quite, and I don't know how many other states do this, but certainly the federal government does. They issue uh, letters that are binding rulings on, on particular issues that a taxpayer has. And that helps to clarify not only for that taxpayer, but 
for taxpayers going forward. In, tax, in taxes, there can be a lot of ambiguity, a lot of questions. When you have that and it's binding and it's a process, then the taxpayers are better served, the department and the state is better served because they have clarity unless the, the dis disagreement should be fewer. Uh, Minnesota does not have a letter ruling. They have, a, they have some good things out there for consumers and taxpayers, but they don't have a private letter ruling. And because of that, it's led to some wide swings and variability <laughs> with taxpayers, not only two different taxpayers, but maybe even the same taxpayer being audited three or four years later might have relied on something previously that was uh, that an auditor had presented or the department, and now four years later or three years later uh, is completely different. So the private letter ruling would be a little bit binding. And the, the, my testifiers will fill in the gaps, but it establishes a program as the, uh, as the uh, briefing explains. It allows them to establish uh, fee, cre uh, collect fees, um, and gives public access to this, and then requires a legislative report so we know how many and what areas are being questioned. It also helps us understand where we might have some problems. Uh, dual examinations, limitation on the taxes, and uh, limits on assessments. So there's more to it, but it's pretty comprehensive. They've been working on it for years, and we really need to come to some agreement with the department to make this go forward. It will benefit the state and the taxpayers. It's, it's a great idea. So with that, I'll yield to the two testifiers. Okay, uh, why don't we start out with Mr. Fragnito. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Take Chair. Your name and, uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you. My name is Gino Fragnito, and I'm the Government Relations Director at the Minnesota CPA Society, and we thank Senator Chamberlain for bringing Senate File 1537 <coughs> to address a number of changes to tax administration that CPAs believe will increase compliance with state tax law, decrease compliance costs for both the taxpayer and the state, while also providing clear guidance to taxpayers who might need some additional information or help. Taxpayers want to comply with the law, and the creation of a private letter ruling program would provide more clarity to aid with this compliance in an increasingly ever complex tax world. This private letter ruling program would also provide clear guidance in gray areas or where the tax law may be silent or open to additional interpretation. As Senator Chamberlain mentioned, the Department of Revenue does have their revenue notice program, and in many situations, this guidance is adequate. While the notice, notices do serve a large set of taxpayers, tax law continues to be more complex, and some taxpayers are inc increasingly finding that the revenue notices may not cover the issue that they're looking at. And while I'll give you an example. It's not an apples-to-apples apples comparison, but if you think of medicine where a general practitioner can serve the needs of many individuals, but specialists are still needed in more complex cases, so too is the case with the revenue notices and the private letter ruling program. We also believe that the private letter ruling is less costly than litigation that could ensue from ambiguities in the law, and taxpayers deserve to have some firm guidance as they make decisions about business expansion and help Minnesota's economy grow and prosper. Senator Chamberlain did mention that the IRS does have this program and 48 other states actually have some type of a private letter ruling program. Minnesota and Alaska are the only two states that don't. Alaska has no income tax or a sales tax and so I, I think if it works well in other states it certainly can work well here. A couple other important issues in this bill would set some limits on the department's authority to assess additional tax as a result of conf conflicting interpretations from different state auditors when there has not been a statute or rule change. And then uh, in addition, it would allow taxpayers to request in writing that the commissioner do a dual audit if a taxpayer is going to be audited for under Chapter 290 with the individual income and corporate franchise tax or under Chapter 297A, sales and use tax, the taxpayer would be authorized or allowed to request that the department do both of those audits at once so they're in the business one time and not causing a potentially longer disruption than needed. So in closing, most Minnesotans want to comply with the law and anything you can do to make this easier is a benefit to all. This legislation would provide some certainty to those individuals who need more clarity and 
to a group who are willing to pay an additional fee so they can correctly comply with the law. Authoritative guidance from tax administrators is an integral part of ensuring taxpayer and tax preparer compliance with the laws, and we believe this legislation moves us in that direction. Thank you for, your, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, uh, Mr. <coughs> Ragnito. Any uh, questions of uh, Mr. Ragnito at this point? Sensing none, uh, we move on. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Martin. Mr. Mr. Martin, uh, please uh, state your name and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members of the Taxes Committee, my name is Chris Martin. I'm a senior manager with Grant Thornton, uh, an accounting firm and supporting member of the Minnesota CPA Society. I assist our business and individual clients on Minnesota and other state and local tax matters. I'm here to testify in support of Chair Chamberlain's bill, Senate File 1537, as a whole, but particularly Section 1, which would establish a private letter ruling program in Minnesota. All of Minnesota's taxpayers, businesses, large and small, and individuals would benefit from this adoption. 48 other states allow taxpayers to request a ruling in some form from their state tax authority. PLRs provide guidance to all taxpayers where the law, regulations, and administrative guidance are silent. In various industry surveys and discussions with the Department of Revenue, taxpayers and tax practitioners have indicated a strong desire for more transparency and more certainty in order to comply in an ever increasingly complex tax world. And a PLR program would help to accomplish this. PLRs or private letter rulings, it's a bit of a misnomer. It, while it is issued to a private party, they would be available online for the public to view. Um, they're freely available online, and if one taxpayer is dealing with this issue, it is likely that others are as well. For example, small businesses trying to understand how to comply with the sales tax law or how Minnesota conforms to a federal tax reform matter could search and view the private letter rulings online and get a better sense of how the department views these questions before they file their tax returns in order to avoid underpayment penalties. It would also help to avert tax litigation, which consumes a disproportionate amount of time by the taxpayers and by the Department of Revenue. A taxpayer who requests a private letter ruling must proactively disclose its name and the facts in an effort to receive direction on a particular transaction or fact pattern. Now this transparency of the taxpayer demonstrates a level of openness and a desire to comply with the law, which is always a positive. And it gives the department also more insight into a taxpayer's facts and its business, which can be beneficial as the department administers the state's laws. The Department of Revenue has done an excellent job in providing guidance at a high level to a broad range of taxpayers and has promised to issue more revenue notices. However, revenue notices do not, and they are not intended to address all possible contingencies or fact patterns. And in addition, revenue notices may take many months longer to draft and publish than the 90-day requirement in this bill. So in conclusion, a healthy and well-established PLR program would have a broad application to thousands of taxpayers and does not need to come at the expense of the educational services the department currently provides to all taxpayers. Minnesota businesses, individual filers, CPAs would deserve a robust guidance in order to ensure that taxpayers who are paying for Minnesota's future are well-equipped to do so. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wagner. Uh, any questions? <coughs> if not, uh, we. Pardon me. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Martin. <laughs> Quite all right, Mr. <laughs> Apologize. Uh, uh, any questions of Mr. Martin? Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Martin. Can you just, I, I know you touched on this a little bit, but what type of tax issues uh, would a, a PLR request to the DOR be or any examples you can give from other states that you currently make these requests? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, thank you for the question. 
Private letter rulings can cover a variety of issues. We've helped taxpayers uh, request private letter rulings in other states on issues from how to, how to compute their sales factor for a corporate income tax filing, whether or not a particular gain or transaction that they're entering into would be considered business income <coughs> or non-business income. Uh, on the sales tax side, an example that we helped a taxpayer with was in another state, they were a waste disposal service business. And under that state's laws, that was a taxable, potentially taxable uh, service. But on the other hand, they also provided recycling, which was exempt under the sales tax laws. So there were two laws at conflict, and we helped that taxpayer request a ruling and get guidance and clarity in that state. Uh, any further questions? If not, thank you both for your testimony. And uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Ben Wagner. Is he in the audience? Mr. Wagner, and uh, why doesn't uh, Ms. Starr from the Revenue Department come forward as well? So, uh, Mr. Wagner, proceed with your testimony. Identify yourself, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Ben Wagner. I'm the uh, legislative co-chair uh, of the tax section of the Minnesota State Bar Association here to testify in support of Senate File 1537. Um, specifically Section 7.1, which relates to the uh, provision regarding claims for refund. Minnesota statute um, currently uh, creates a, a bit of a problem for taxpayers who either think they don't have a filing obligation um, or fail to file for some reason, and then the Department of Revenue files a return for that individual. Um, if that person who had the department file that return on their behalf then doesn't take action, within a certain time frame, in this case a year, um, it can cause a real problem for that taxpayer because the department might levy bank accounts or, or seize refunds and then apply those levied funds to the obligations that the department prepared on their behalf. If that happens, there's no way for them to get the money back at a later date because they might be outside the scope <coughs> of that one year window. So the language in this section uh, is essentially an attempt to mirror the federal statute which allows for taxpayers to come forward within a two-year payment of any payments being seized or taken or paid and claim the refund of that payment. Now, the burden is on the taxpayer to provide the department with the proof as to why they're entitled the money back. <coughs> um, and again, it, it mirrors the language um, that's at the federal level and is consistent with about two-thirds the states um, in terms of being able to recover the money in that situation. Um, so this would, this would remedy that problem where taxpayers are sort of in a, a bit of a trap if they don't act quickly enough or if they, you know, are unaware that they actually owe the money. Um, this allows them to, to sort of fix that problem. Uh, I should also note, too, that, that we worked with the department to get some improvements to our original draft on this language, and they did make some, some tweaks and changes so that it was more clear in terms of what we were trying to accomplish. Mr. Wagner, any questions of Mr. Wagner? Now, thank you for your testimony. We move on now to the Department of Revenue. And Ms. Starr, what do you have to say? <laughs> Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I... Um, Please introduce yourself. I'm Jenny Starr. I'm an assistant commissioner at the Department of Revenue. I hope um, that you might have a handout in your um, folders for today. Um, I really uh, appreciate the comments um, so far about the quality programs um, that the Revenue Department um, provides today. And I was just hoping um, to walk you through a few details of where we're at um, with the services that we have um, today. And I'll, and I'll try to keep that, that short. So I'll start at the left of that table um, with regard to rules. Um, so rules are um, an opportunity for the department to provide um, guidance on complex laws today. Um, rulemaking um, is binding. Um, so like Minnesota statutes, they reach a broad audience and address complex topics. Uh, we have heard from tax professionals that they'd really like the department to um, get back to more engaged rulemaking. Um, and we have three rulemaking projects going on right now in response to that feedback. Um, one of those um, rules is in the area of corporate franchise tax and was recently uh, promulgated earlier this year. Another is in the area of property tax, um, a rule that we worked very closely on with the Board of Assessors, assessors throughout the state of Minnesota. 
um, in the Office of Administrative Hearings, and we anticipate that rule will be promulgated this spring. And another is in the area of computer software. Um, our computer software rule was uh, last published in 1993. Um, lots has changed in technology um, since then. Um, to work carefully with tax professionals and the industry, uh, we put together an advisory committee consisting of um, 11 uh, professionals in this area, um, met multiple times, and uh, we're hoping um, this year to promulgate an updated um, and modern rule in the area of computer software, um, which is truly a complex area of law. Um, moving to revenue notices, uh, revenue notices are provided in Minnesota statutes by Section 270C.07. Um, these revenue notices provide factual scenarios and explain how the department applies existing Minnesota law um, to those facts. Uh, revenue notices are broadly applicable. They reach a broad audience. Um, they're officially posted in the Minnesota State Register and on our website. And like all of the content we have there, they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, they're searchable um, and available, and we keep them updated with any law changes. We think revenue notices are one of our very best tools for these reasons. They reach a broad audience. They're an efficient use of our resources. They cover complex topics. They're updated for law changes. Um, and most importantly, they're binding on the department, meaning the department cannot assess additional tax contrary to position expressed in a revenue notice for all taxpayers. Now we did start in 2016, um, I think about the time this conversation about this bill began um, to put more emphasis on publishing more revenue notices. And we created a process with the Minnesota CPA Society and the Bar Association to make sure that they have an opportunity to weigh in on those revenue notices prior to those being published. And we created a dedicated resource so that our tax professional partners can let us know what topics and fact patterns they feel are not yet addressed by our guidance and that we can prioritize that work for them. In, 2017, in 2016, we got off to a good start in our effort to increase the number of published revenue notices. Um, we uh, published five more uh, compared to the prior year. In 2017, we did well again. We published 13 revenue notices, five more than the prior year, and, and five more than we published in 20, 2015. Unfortunately, we did have to slow down our work on revenue notices in 2018. Now, the same resources that we use to publish revenue notices um, are the resources we needed um, to do that very important work of understanding the differences between federal, uh, federal income tax laws and Minnesota income tax laws and to prepare for this current filing season and to ensure that we had an operational filing system um, on time for all of our taxpayers. Um, in the summer, we asked our tax professional partners how they would like us to best serve them in this very complicated time, and whether they, would prior they wanted us to prioritize uh, formal revenue notices in the area of these differences between current federal law and Minnesota law, or if they would prefer that we prioritize answering their most frequently asked questions as quickly as possible on our website in a less formal way. Uh, we received direction loud and clear from our tax professional partners here in Minnesota that they wanted quick, understandable answers as quickly as possible to the, their most frequently asked questions. And we delivered, uh, starting in July of 2018, we began posting answers to those questions online. We answered more than 50 frequently asked questions. They reached over 70,000 su subscribers uh, to those who subscribed to our email subscription lists. And we repeatedly provided training to the Minnesota CPA Society and the Bar Association. Um, we really dedicated ourselves um, to a true partnership to get everybody pr as prepared as possible um, for this filing season. Just moving quickly to written guidance, emails, letters. Uh, we help over one million customers in person, over the phone, and by email every year. In 2018, our sales tax division alone answered over 50,000 telephone calls and responded to almost 10,000 emails. We've been working really hard on guidance like industry guides, um, which is a way in which industries can come to our website and find all of the information about sales and use tax that specifically applies to their industry. And last time we talked about this together, we had published about 15 industry guides. Today we have 25. 
And while I don't have time here at committee today uh, to demonstrate the commonality between uh, things like our industry guides, our revenue notices, and our rules, um, if any member of the committee would, would like to meet with me later, I'd be happy to show you comparisons between private letter ruling programs in other states and the guidance that's pr um, provided by the Department of Revenue. Um, and we could and look at the visuals that show um, the commonality of those resources. There is great variation in the level of formality of PLR programs across other states. Some are as informal as answering basic questions um, that we do over email today. Some PLR programs are highly formalized. They cost as much as $10,000 to answer a complex question. Some programs answer hundreds of questions a year, including counting letters that simply tell a requester that the agency is not going to or can't answer the question. Some programs are free but answer no questions a year or as few as 10 or 20. Today in Minnesota, we prioritize guidance that provides all of our customers with timely information, education, and services, and we reallocate our resources as nimbly as we can to address changes in our customers' needs as we did this year um, with the current filing season. And very quickly, I, uh, as to the remainder of the bill, um, our current programs are designed to decrease, decrease burdens and increase service to customers by answering their questions, um, making adjustments while processing returns, using techniques like sampling to decrease the burdens on our customers during audits. In review of this bill, the department believes the opposite would happen, longer audit timelines, more intensive document requests, more time at a business's location during an audit, multiple auditors interacting with the same taxpayer at the same time, increases to the amount of time to it takes to process returns, and increased litigation. And while we can't estimate a revenue impact, um, we do anticipate the impact could be substantial, especially in sales tax with regard to sections four and six of the bill. Sales tax, as you know, today contributes around six billion annually to the state's general fund. With regards to administrative costs, I don't believe at this time a formal fiscal note has been requested, or at least that request hasn't made it to the department. But I just want to preview um, that we think that the costs at the department could be substantial. Um, preliminary uh, estimates within the department suggest at least 75 or possibly more than 100 new FTE associated with the entirety of the bill which is somewhere around seven and a half million dollars. Um, I do appreciate uh, the feedback that we hear um, from the chair, uh, from our tax professional partners who te have testified today. We are always looking for ways to efficiently use and continuously improve the resources that we have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Starr. Any questions for Ms. Starr? Okay, I think we've heard quite a bit on this one. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, you want to wrap it up? Yes. <laughs> in, uh, in, in short, uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, uh, Assistant Commissioner. In short, um, it's, uh, it's needed. As uh, Mr. Fragnino said, it'll increase compliance, decrease costs, and better serve our customers and the taxpayers. Thank you. Okay. With that, uh, then, without objection, Senate File uh, 1537 is held over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. Okay, Senator Senjum, you have Senate File 1529 and no amendments, I understand. Uh, no amendments, Mr. Chair, and uh, given the uh, clock on the wall, I think I'm going to uh, avoid uh, 
uh, being uh, duplicative uh, with the, maybe the comments of my witness. Uh, this happens to do relate to the so-called unrelated business uh, income tax uh, affects nonprofits. It's important. There's no cost. Uh, there's a, uh, a retroactive enactment date to December 31, 2017. With that, Mr. Chair, I want to simply refer my, to my witness, and uh, he'll carry this forward, and we'll stand for questions. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Yes. Good morning, Chairman Chamberlain, Senator Senjum. My name is John Pratt. I'm Executive Director of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. Welcome. Continue. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 1529. This bill would ensure that Minnesota does not conform to the federal UBIT changes impacting nonprofits, churches, and foundations. The two federal changes in UBIT laws from the 2017 tax bill uh, would not ensure that money and resources are used for the right purposes. Instead, they would divert money and resources away from each nonprofit's mission. Uh, there are two parts to, to this. Uh, the first provision deals with transportation expenses. If Minnesota would conform to the change that's in the federal bill, nonprofits and churches would be charged for the cost of parking and transit benefits they provide to employees. Parking spots and transit passes are necessary expenses uh, as part of their employment and should not be taxed. Importantly, applying UBIT to these expenses is kind of turns UBIT on its head, uh, which is to tax unrelated business income, not expenses. For more than 60 years, nonprofits have been paying UBIT on business activities. That's appropriate. Uh, but requiring these organizations to pay a state tax on these employee benefits is something that has never been required before. Besides the increased operating costs, many nonprofits, especially small ones and churches, will have an administrative and financial burden of filing an additional tax form that they've never had to file before. The second provision requires creating separate silos for each activity. This is 512A6. Under prior law, all nonprofit unrelated business expenses were reported alongside their business income, and organizations would not owe UBIT if total expenses were greater than income across business activities. Requiring the creation of separate silos uh, and an income and expense line for each different activity instead of the whole is unprecedented and adds complexity and diverts resources from the public benefit activities of Minnesota's charitable organizations. Uh, the uh, Minnesota Council of Churches, Reverend Dr. Curtis DeYoung sent a letter to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, sort of supporting this and to quote him in part, if Minnesota conforms, it would create additional burdens for churches. As churches do not have systems set up to pay state taxes, it is likely that the burdensome accounting and regulatory compliance costs will exceed the tax actually collected. So as you're putting together your tax bill, I would urge you not to conform to these federal changes impacting nonprofits, churches, and foundations. This will add to the momentum to remove them at the federal level as well. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Mr. Pratt. Um, members, any questions? None. Senator Senjum. Uh, just to conclude, uh, thank you so much. This is this is actually very, very important to our nonprofit sector out there, and uh, uh, the intent is to keep uh, keep their money directed in the uh, in the mission of the nonprofit, uh, not uh, not in, uh, in in taxation. So. Uh, Hope you can support this. Uh, it's a uh, be kind to nonprofit bill, and uh, <laughs> for that we uh, will close and uh, recommend uh, to you strong consideration. Thank you, Senator Senjum. With that, Senate File 1529 held over for possible inclusion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next up, finally, is Senator Bingham, 632. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and we will be very brief. Um, thank you first for hearing uh, Senate File 632 today. Uh, we know that many farmers are land rich and uh, cash poor, and we also know farmers are starting to age out of farming. So simply put, uh, how Senate File 632 allows that after the original eight years of being in ag 
the Ag Preserve Program that with a mutual agreement voted on by the local governing body and by local governing body that is whoever has the authority for zoning. So if that's a charter, if that's a city, according to a charter, um, or else it would be a county, city, um, or township, uh, they would have to agree to it. Uh, they would be allowed to be removed. So if you really, if you have your original eight and then you start another eight, but midway through that you decided you want to get out, they would be allowed to get out. <coughs> So um, with me today, I have two testifiers in support of the bill. We have Cottage Grove Mayor Myron Bailey and Cottage Grove Farmer Gene Samalich, who actually brought this bill to me, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. So I'm going to start with the mayor. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senators and uh, Chair uh, Chamberlain. Uh, my name is Myron Bailey, and I'm the mayor of Cottage Grove. Uh, we are a growing community on the East Metro. Uh, I would just share with you real quick, because uh, I know time is short, that our city currently has about 36,000 people, and by 2030, with the plans, uh, we expect to be around 42,000 people. We have a, an extremely fast-growing uh, business park uh, with uh, some major uh, businesses that are currently in the Renewal by Anderson, which has over 700 people. Uh, 3M uh, has their plant there with over 700 people. We have Up North Plastics that currently has 250 workers, and they're about to double their size and add it, uh, another 200 to 250. Uh, and we are actually witnessing in Cottage Grove about a 25% increase in our concentration of, of production supervisors since 2011. Um, our strategic plan within our city is to continue to position ourselves for growth. And one of the things, uh, which is why we're here today, is I believe each of you did get a map uh, of our city uh, that uh, outlines also the MUSA line as it relates to development. You will notice, uh, as I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Gene Smolich here in a few, few seconds, um, you can see the blue area on the map is the property that's in question here that we're looking uh, for your support uh, to shorten the length uh, to be able to pull that out of Egg Preserve. This area down where his property is located, uh, we currently have had two RFPs come in for businesses that want to locate in this area on over 100 acres. In this particular case, when they find out that this piece of property uh, is in the egg preserve and is going to take up to eight years to get out, uh, they walk away uh, because they said they can't wait that long. They're looking to get in the ground and start building within months and not years. And so what I'm asking for as the mayor of Cottage Grove and, and a representative of Mr. Smallage here is for your consideration to approve this process for us to remove this sliver of property that's in our business park uh, to take it out of the egg preserve. One last thing I'll mention, you'll notice on the far right-hand side, Cottage Grove has a lot of rural areas also. And all of those areas in yellow are currently in the uh, egg preserve uh, program. We have no desire to be working with any of them. Those are probably years, if not decades, out in advance before they would need to come out or if the farmers wanted them to come out. So I'm here in support of Gene uh, and the city of Cottage Grove to move this forward. So I guess I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Gene Smolich. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Gene Smallage. I'm a farmer in Cottage Grove. Some of the land we farm as is this parcel has been farmed continuously by our family for 102 years. As the mayor already stated, my immediate neighbors to this piece of property are 3M Cottage Grove, Renewal by Anderson, Up North Plastics, and numerous other businesses and factories in the Cottage Grove Industrial Park. Twice within the last four years, a commercial real estate agent came to Cottage Grove looking for an uh, industry site as large as 320, 320 acres. And that would have provided many, many jobs for the state of Minnesota. Our 120-acre parcel, which was a part of that search site, <clears throat> has been in the Ag Preserves program since 1982. That program was originally set up in the seven county area to protect farmers from assessments on storm sewer, sanitary sewer, water, and roads. <clears throat> we were led to believe over the years that the governor had the authority if there was a large economic project coming that he could waive the eight year waiting period. During this search process, we found out that that was not the case. <clears throat> you might say, well, why don't you just 
apply to get out now and in eight years your land is available for development. I want to tell you this is scary and I want to give you two examples. In the year 2000, the Met Council decided to greatly increase the size of the Cottage Grove sewer treatment plant. It was decided that all the roads leading to the plant were not adequate for heavy truck traffic necessary for construction. Therefore, those roads were to be widened and upgraded. <clears throat> Our 120 acre parcel of land has one and three eighths miles of frontage on that route. The Met Council had agreed to pay for half of the upgrade and Cottage Grove was to pay for the other half. At the same time, a three foot bike path on each side on the shoulders was being discussed. The city ran into difficulties on the west side of the road, we're on the east side, and they came back to us and said, might we change the plan and put the bike Mr. path? Mr. Smallage? Yes. I hate to interrupt, I, I, I do. We understand what you're trying to get at here. You're giving me the details of the plan, which are great. I'll talk to you afterwards. But uh, so what we're looking for is to, the just to go to one year, so you can offload this, so you can get the work done, right? We're and and looking, it's not unprecedented. We're looking to go if a project is available mm -hmm. through mutual agreement between the municipality and the property owner, you're out immediately. That would make the project feasible. You got it. <laughs> We're thank good. You, Senator Bingham, any final words? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Senator Bingham. Good seeing you. Thank you for coming down. And with that, Senate File 632 will be held over for possible inclusion. Thank you very much. Have a thank good thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Members, Tuesday. Well, whoever's left. Uh, we'll adjourn now. <laughs>